Major support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Bakersfield West Rotary Stroop Family Foundation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and the Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. And I'm Scott. And in studio with us, we have Stanley today. And Stanley, if somebody wanted to get in contact with us for math help, how would they do that? For math homework help, call in Bakersfield 636-4357, toll free 1-866-636-6284, email dothemath at current.org, or online at dothemathonline.net, and on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. A lot of different ways to call us, huh? All right, well, you know what? We actually have a problem that was sent to us by email not one, but two of them that we need to solve today. That's good. And we're going to have young Stanley help us out with that. Now, before we get started, why don't you let everybody know where you go to school and what grade you're in. I go to school at Stockdale Elementary, and I'm in fifth grade. How's fifth grade going? Really good. Really good? What's really good about it? Uh, I like math. You like math. Well, you know what? That's good. Uh, what kinds of math are you doing right now? Um, we're doing multiplying decimals and dividing decimals. So you're working with decimals? Yes. Perfect. You're going to be working with fractions later on this year also. But guess what you're going to do now? I Neither one of those. <laughs> I've got a surprise. We have to do one of the email problems. So head on over to the board with Scott. Here's the problem. <clears throat> this is an email from Riley. Uh, doesn't say what grade Riley is in or what school, but Riley, hopefully you're viewing the program right now, and we can work this out for you. Fiona bought 212 stickers. And Fiona's going to make a sticker book. Okay. Okay. And she can put 18 stickers on every page. Ooh, so 18 over here and 18 over here and on all the other pages. And the question is, how many pages will be in the booklet if she does all 212 stickers? Whoa. Stanley, so what I do you mean, want to do here? Yeah. What do you think? Uh, you want to figure it out. Do you have a strategy that you could use here to figure out how many pages it would be? Um, <clears throat> multiply. You could multiply. Now tell 12. me what would happen if we had 212 times 18. Would that be a really big number or a really small number? Really big. That would be a really big number. And you'd probably have a book that would be about this thick, huh? And it wouldn't be the best idea to do stickers. So just kind of by thinking about this logically, that may not be the best idea to multiply. What else do you think we could do on this oh, kind of a problem like this? Divide. We could divide, yeah. I think that's probably what we want to do. So if I were going to set up a division problem like this, which of these numbers would go inside and which would go outside? There you go. Um, and 18 on the outside. Good for you. Okay, so take me through this problem here. What's going to happen when you divide 18 into 212? Um, you like this big division stuff, huh? So do my students. They love it. Super fun. How about this? I got a couple questions for you. We're going to look at this whole 18 thing, right? Does 18 go into 2? No. No. How about does 18 go into 21? Um, yeah. Yeah? How many times? 1. There you go. Good for you. Exactly right. So 1 times 18 is 18. Is 18. You got it. And if you subtract, what's 21 minus 18? Mm -hmm. Do a little borrow in there. Good. Good. And what's next? Yeah, got a zero there. And bring down the two. Good. Walk us through this as you're doing it so people can understand what's going on in your head because it seems like your head is doing some good stuff. So you brought down the two, right? Yes. Okay, so now we have to decide, hmm, does 18 go into 32 once or twice? Mm -hmm. That's a tough one, huh? 
You want to do it over here? Real quick, on the side, do 18 times 2 so we can figure out what that answer is and see if it's higher than 32. Gotcha, 36. So if we did a 2 here, 2 times 18 is 36, that's too much. So we, so we still to have to one. go with one. a 1, that's it. And we have an 18 here. And subtract. Good, 12 minus 8 is 4, and 2 <laughs> minus 1 is 1. There you go. So I'm going to go ahead and be the narrator for your head. <laughs> so we have a little bit of a remainder, right? We got some extra stickers that haven't gotten a page. So the question was, how many pages are going to be in this book? What do you think the answer is? 11. 11. What do we do with all these stickers that are left over? Um. This is kind of one of those real life problems, and you really do have to consider what else is left over, because we don't want to have a book with 11 pages and a whole bunch of stickers on the outside just kind of flopping around. That's no good. So what we're going to do is we're going to think about the fact that maybe this extra is going to be added to here. In other words, this is another page, even though the page isn't full with stickers, even though the page doesn't have 18 stickers total, we still need to have a page for those 14 stickers. So knowing that, we would have 11 pages plus... 14. Not quite 14, because remember, they're going to go on one Four. page, right? So we're going to add one more to it. So now, can you tell me how many pages it would have? 12. That's it, good. So that's a good logical way to go through that problem. At the very end, you go, our answer in the division problem was 11. But we really have to think about it realistically and say, if we have 14 stickers left over, they need a home, right? We're going to add one more page, even though it's not a full page. So 12 pages would at least put all the stickers into the book, right? Okay. There you go. Nice work. Nicely done. Come on over here, Stanley. <clears throat> Here's another problem that you can kind of think of. The car that you come over in today, how many people can fit in that car? Six, eight. Eight people? OK. So let's say eight people can fit in that car but you need to bring 10 people someplace. How many cars will you need? Two, or one. Can you fit all 10 in one car? Two, two. You need two cars, two. right? See, even though there's gonna be a couple of people in the second car, you still need the second car, all right? So just another way to kind of think about that type of problem right there. Easy first one, right? <laughs> there you go. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30 most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year, but time now for today's Math in the News. And in studio with us today, we have Aaliyah. And how are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm wonderful myself. Now, I'm good. trying to make sure I've got this right. The Wonder League. Have you ever heard of the Wonder League? Mm -mm. Have you ever heard of the Wonder League? Sounds something like a superhero type of deal. Uh, right. Maybe that was the Wonder Team. <laughs> but the Wonder League robotics team, or their challenge they had. Tell us a little bit about this Wonder League that you were part of. Well, it's a robotics competition, and I used these robots, this one particularly for last year. And instead of building our robots, we program them. Okay. Now. This, Aliyah's not here because she participated in this event. You won this event. Wow. Okay, now this isn't something that just happened in Bakersfield or Kern County. Explain a little bit about who was in this competition and where it took place. Well, it was a robotics competition around the whole world. And to send, to submit our entries, we had to like submit them through online. So okay. we didn't go anywhere, we just did it from home. Okay. And how long a process was this? I mean, from when you first found out about it and then doing everything until the competition ended? Uh, last year's competition was like the whole year. So it's a year-long process, mm -hmm. okay? And obviously, before you get to this point, you have to have some planning and things like that, right? So tell us a little bit about that for students that are like, oh, yeah, that sounds really fun, but the work behind it. Because I think we have one of your pages here, right, from your journal? Yeah. So what kinds of things go into this? So for the challenges, we were supposed to log our thought process and like our plan and how we're going to do the mission. And then we do it and then we talk about how it worked and what we need to improve on and stuff like that. Okay. You see one photo right here. What is this a photo of? That's a photo of one of the attachments that I designed to solve one of their challenges. Okay. So you had to design this make sure it worked properly, 
And how long did that take? Well, that was not my only one. That wasn't the final one. Okay. So um, there was that one too. There were, it took a long time to find <laughs> one that actually worked, right? So it was a long process. Okay, and I think we have a video here. This is a short video, so we'll go through it a couple of times. But explain to us what's going on here. Okay, so that's my robot, and it's picking up the box and hitting the ping pong balls and knocking them into the <laughs> cup. <laughs> now, is it, so it, was it where you had to pick up all three at the same time? Um, you didn't have to, but I did. It was cool. <laughs> and well, it yeah, I was like, well, got all three at the same time instead of just getting one at a time. And then let's go ahead and watch this again. Now, what was it that got you, first of all, even interested in doing something like this? Well, I got those two robots for the first time at Christmas, like five or six years ago, and I started entering their competitions, and I did it through, throughout a couple of years, and then, yeah. Okay, so you're in high school now. Yeah. So you received these when you were, what, like fifth grade, fourth grade, something like that? Okay, which is about how old you are, right? The, have you ever done anything with robots or would like to? Well, this is the person to talk to right now. We need to listen to Aaliyah. So explain the differences between these robots that you've got right here with us today. Okay. So these two, they have wheels, so they can obviously drive around. This one is just a standalone, it, but it can communicate to this robot through these sensors here. And so it can communicate to those and they can know where they are located and so they can play like hide and seek and stuff with each other and this one is for older kids like my grade and like 14 through however old you want to okay. be when you use them. Now there's a little bit of difference because there are some robotics competitions going on around all of the time and we even feature a robot rumble here once a month uh, where there are some that are remote controlled and then there are other types. What are the other types? The other types are programmed. And how involved is that? Like, does that take a long time to get the program and then have the robot do exactly what you want it to do? Yes, it's a long process. Okay, now I think you've actually, we'll see if your phone put that up <laughs> here and we'll show an example of, uh, so that's coding. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how did you start that? Or did you just kind of like learn it on your own? Or was there a class you took or a club or anything like that? Um, actually, they have different apps for these robots. One is a remote control on, and the, other are, the others are like you can do with blocks, block coding. And then the one that I'll be showing you has, um, you can switch between JavaScript and the block coding. Okay, and this is all something that you kind of got on your own. Mm -hmm. You learned this on your own. Do you have any idea how many other entries there were or people you were competing against with that competition last year? Um, I really don't know, but there were people from all over the world. There were a lot. Did you have an opportunity to correspond with any of them, to talk about ideas, or it was just, here's my project and I know I'm competing against other kids all across the world? Yeah. Now, was it only for, like, people your age, or was it anybody that wanted to do it? There are different levels, so you could be really young. I don't know what the youngest age group was, but there were different age groups, and I was in the 14, 12 to 14 age group. Okay, so we're gonna see if we can see a little bit about that. Let's see if we can focus it a little. And we can see the icons on the side really well, but tell us a little bit about what we're looking at right now for students that have no idea what they're looking at. <laughs> so that's one of my programs. The first block is, like you can do many different things with the blocks of coding and that, so this one is having it move. As you can see, it says move distance and that's one that tells it how far to move and what speed to move at. Okay, so I know some of the students that probably can't see the distance, but what would be an example of the distance that you have in there? What did you have in there? So, uh, I, it, so it says 100? That's always in centimeters. Okay, so that's key to, make sure that they know that it's in centimeters, not inches or feet or something like that. Yeah. And then it says speed is 20. Or maybe, yeah, I think it's 20 it says. Mm -hmm. And what's that? 
Um, I'm not sure. It, if um, we did 100, okay. it would obviously go a lot faster what it was doing? Yeah. Okay. And so that's the first line of code. Hmm. How many lines of code do you use to get, like let's say the one that we saw the video. Hmm. Did you have to program that like this? Yeah. And how long did it take for you to be able to have that robot accomplish that? Um, I don't remember how many lines of code it took, but it was... More than 100? No. <laughs> okay, that's with... Yeah, not too many. Okay. Now, obviously you've gotten into this. You kind of took it upon yourself to learn about these things. You've done well with them. Has that sparked anything else that will come in the future for you? Well, when I was visiting their company, they one of the people talked to me about how important it was to use drawing to communicate ideas and so I was thinking about the drawing and so I'm actually now interested in animation. There you go. So this sparked something else could lead to a career in animation and who knows where that's gonna go for. Yeah. All right. Well we certainly do thank Aaliyah for coming in this afternoon. Wonder League champion. Not only participant, but you won the whole thing against other people across the entire planet. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30, but right now we have an opportunity. We're going to go out live to Old River Elementary, visit with one of the classrooms and Devin. Hey, thanks a lot. Welcome to Old River Elementary. Today we're in the classroom of uh, Mr. Clay McCombs here. Clay, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thanks for having us. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm excited to have you guys here. So I teach kids with uh, severe autism, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade here at Old River Elementary. You've really focused a lot of this space on um, really interacting with mathematics in a lot of different ways. And we're going to explore a lot of those uh, firsthand. But while we're talking about hands, uh, I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to share uh, a structure for number sense that uh, your students have really grown to as far as ways of interacting and making sense of math. And that's called touch math. So guide us a little bit through some of the, the figures we have here and what touch math looks like and kind of describe what it feels like to our kids. Okay, so we use a system of numbers that have what's called touch points. And for example, zero has no value, so there's no touch points on zero. If we're using the number one, the number one has a value of one, so there's one touch point. So if a child was to be counting the number one, they could do so with their pencil and they would touch the touch point and they could mentally think the number one or audibly say one and so on. When we get to two, two has a value of two, of course. So the number two has two touch points. And we, we count from the top to bottom. So we would count one, two from the number three again it is a value of three so we have three single touch points so we count one two three for the number four four has four touch points so we would count one two three four and one thing i love about the touch math system is sometimes my students are a little nervous um, they want to be accepted in a general education classroom so they don't want to count with their fingers while they're counting so this provides a system for them to count with their pencil so if they were going to count five they could use the tip of their pencil and count the dots one two three four five so they'd be able to transfer that over in written representations of those numbers with their pencil, even if they don't have those raised bumps to kind of guide them through that. They can still use that process of, of kind of counting with the values using the number itself. Yeah. So the goal is to get them to master the recognition that the number five, for example, has a value of five and has five touch points. But on a math worksheet, those touch points are not going to be there. So they would therefore count one, two, three, four, five. And that's how they would count the number five without the touch points. Now, when we get to some of these larger numbers, obviously you're not going to count 
eight dots on the number eight. So there is a system in place for some of those larger value digits. Yeah. So for example, on six and above, we have double touch points. So that second rep ring over there is a second point to touch. So you could theoretically kind of skip count by twos on these. You could. Yeah. So if we were going to count the number six, we would say one, two, three, four, five, six. That's how we would count six. Seven has double rings and one single ring. So we would count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And eight has four double touch points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And lastly, we have nine. So again, we have a system of double touch points and a single touch point. So we would count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this system really works well when you're first learning your number concepts. It also works really well when you're beginning to learn single digit addition. Let's say, for example, we were going to add, let's start off with 5 plus 3. And we'll pull we this. have that on black construction paper so you can write on, write on it with a white pencil. Yeah. And that makes it very visible uh, for students, almost kind of like their own chalkboard, but a little bit more permanent. Yeah. So if we were going to do 5 plus 3 equals. So. There's two ways of doing this. So you could count all of the touch points if you chose to do so. So they could literally start at five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. So then they would, they would come up with the answer eight. But let's say they already know that the five has a value of five, and they want to get this problem done in a quicker manner. So they would say the larger number, would, in this case it's five, and then they would count on. So we would say five, six, seven, eight. So touch math ends up being a great structure to, to move forward from simply counting everything together and to start counting on, which is a big growth point when kids start to make sense of operations such as addition or subtraction. They realize I could save myself a bunch of time by just starting at the value that I have first. So this ends up being a very powerful bridge to move students into other operations. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Our students, they gravitate towards it. Um, I've seen them you know, obtain mastery with, with their different operations. Um, I have children that are, have even started to do, to do division, um, which is really neat to watch um, and see that growth. Um, it's just, it's a really, really great program. We love using it in our class. And with this program, it serves as a bridge to other really complex mathematical sequences. So when we come back here at Old River Elementary, we're going to look at how Mr. McCombs, how Mr. Clay uh, t looks at the Fibonacci sequence and the different visuals that that takes and how students start to explore that through art. But for now, we're going to send it back to the studio. Mike, take it away. All right. Thanks for that, Devin. And also thank you to Clay and sharing with us some of the strategies that they use in that classroom to learn math and there are hundreds of ways to do different problems and no one way is the only way you just need to find a way that is comfortable for you and that will help you solve your problems math problems that is. <laughs> six three six four three five seven is the phone number we do have phone tutors available until five thirty on most tuesdays and wednesdays throughout the regular school year as a note remember email do the math at kern.org however if you email us a problem you would try to do that on Tuesday morning, Tuesday or Wednesday morning so that we can do the problem for you on the air Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, if you send it to us Thursday or Friday, by all means we'll get it, we'll be able to do it, but you won't see it until the following Tuesday or Wednesday. So here's another one of those problems that was sent to us uh, by a mom and they wanted to know how they could better help their child understand equivalent fractions. So let's take a look at the problem that was sent to us on the email. We just printed it out and it said, what fractions are equal to one and what fractions are equal to two? And they have a, a number line and it's split into thirds. And they also have some whole numbers and then they have a number line divided into sixths. So 
Stanley, you and Scott are going to go ahead and work on this, and then with some other number lines as well. All right, take it away, right. boys. Sounds good. So what do you think? What do you see here in the top number line, Stanley? Anything specific that's going on up there? There's, it's only three, there's only three in the bottom. Mm -hmm. So we're split into thirds, right? So we have three yeah. pieces. Here are the pieces. One, two, three pieces, right? Three pieces of that number line. What about the next number line? What do you see here? There's six pieces. Mm -hmm. Can you count them with the back side of your pen here so we don't erase anything? Count the pieces. Okay, this is before zero. So here's a piece in between these two marks. So there's one. One, Good. two, three, four, five, six. Six. There you go. So that's the piece that comes before. At the end of this piece, you have six out of six pieces, right? At the end of this piece, this is the third piece out of a six total. How about the bottom one? There's 12. There's 12? There's well, what 12 about this pieces. piece? What's this piece right here? What's the very first one? Um, I don't have a label there. What do you think it is? 112. 112. How come I think I skipped it? Um, well, I'm not trying to hide anything, I promise. But watch this. Watch. See, it's really hard to write really small in here. What would be the next one over here? This is one, two. What's the next one? Three. Three. And it's really hard to squeeze them in there. So sometimes I skip them. And sometimes you'll see your textbook skip numbers every once in a while. Like you can have a number line that goes by fives. You could have a number line that goes by tens, even whole numbers. And so all I did here with our fractions was I skipped a couple of numbers, just did the even ones so that we could still see way, the way they line up, but also know that there's another spot in between them, okay? So if I were going to ask you, what does this number here represent, this little line right here that doesn't have a number underneath it? 11. 11, that's right. So at least you know what it is, so you understand the pattern here. All right, so the first question that we have here is, we want to know in the very first number line, which of these fractions is equal to 1? How do you know that? Because 3 and 3 is one, is 1 whole. You said 3 and 3. So and, the word and in, me, in math means addition. So tell me a little bit more about 3 and 3. 3 over 3, what does three. that mean? Add, subtract, multiply, divide. Um, you said it equals 1, right? So that's great. I like that. Is that add, subtract, multiply, or divide? Um, well, you could go through them. 3 divide. plus 3. Divide. There you go. That's right. So fractions mean divide. I try to let my students know the same thing. And whenever you see a fraction, basically what you're doing is dividing. Okay, here's the next question I have for you. I want you to tell me, just look at the middle number line here, right? Okay, the middle one, the one with the six on the bottom. Which fraction is the same, has the same value as one third? Um. That's it, there you go. And you can see a nice picture of it here because you can see these things line up, right? Mm -hmm. And you can also see that if you have two over six and one over three, if you're good at reducing fractions or simplifying fractions, you could divide both of these by two, and you'd end up with one third. Here's and, the next question. Go and ahead. you can look at the space. There's you just can look one at the space, the right? That's exactly right. And that's what I wanted to show on this problem is, and the the one that we saw on the projector, we wanted to show that the space is exactly the same. So even though these ones have different numbers, they represent the same value. Next question for you. Ready? Look at this number two thirds. Look at the very bottom one. Which one is the same as two thirds? That's it. So eight and twelve. Those are a lot bigger numbers than two and three, but both of those fractions have the same value, right? If you were gonna measure from here to here and here to here, they would have the same length, okay? So we can see a physical representation. Now the ultimate question we have about this problem is, we wanna know which of these fractions equal one. You told me that three over three equals one. What other fractions on these two equal one, on these two number lines? This six one, over six, six yeah. Six over six equals one, and 12 over 12 equals one. Gotcha, how do you know that? That um, they all have one, they're all one holes and they're the same number over the same number, so they're one hole. Right, that's a good way to put it. If you have the same number over the same number, they're going to be one hole because you're going to be dividing. Let's move over here real quickly. Mike, do we have time to do this? Yes, indeed. Okay, good. We want to look over at this one. Now, these are a little bit different number lines, okay? There's only two of them that you see here. I didn't give you any other point of reference. The first thing I want you to do on the top one, this is thirds. Where is one? Good. And where's one on the bottom one? There it is. So at least we have something that we noticed from the first ones, right? Something that's familiar. However, these number lines keep on going, right? They go past one. So tell me about six over three. What does that one represent? That one, uh, 
Well, um... It's a different way to look at it, huh? So I'm glad we drew a picture of it. So we have one-third, two-thirds, three-thirds. Three of these pieces equal one. Let's count the pieces over here. One, two, three pieces. So the space in here is one, and the space in here is one. So what do you think this represents? One plus one is? Two. Two. What's six divided by three? Six divided by three is two. Two. That's why it's always good to remember that fractions mean divide. Can you tell me which of the fractions on the bottom number line equal two, or which fraction equals two? 12 over 6. How would you know that? Because 12, or 6 times 2 equals 12. Uh -huh. Or the other way around? Or 12 divided by 6 equals 2. Now you got it. Fractions mean divide. So take that top number, divide it by the bottom number, and you have the whole number. So if we were looking at whole numbers here, this one would be, oh, I'm sorry, this one would be 2, right? This one. That one would be 1. This one would be 1. Thank you for helping me fix that right there. And you can see, again, because we've lined these number lines up nicely, you can see the space here is the same as the space here. The space here is the same as the space there. It's a great way to look at equivalent fractions, not only with division at the end, but also to see the physical space that they take up. Nice job. I think I appreciate you helping me out on that one. There you go. Little introduction to fractions because you're going to be doing a lot of those in fifth grade. For your great effort right there, we've got yourself a item from Chick-fil-A. So congratulations <laughs> on that. Hey, we do have another opportunity to visit Old River. We'll do that right after this. Today we're at Rio Bravo School, home of the Gauchos, and we're here to... Rio yeah! Well, today we're at Rio Bravo School, working with some 5th grade students, and we're going to do a little bit of math right now. So what we need to do is, first of all, make sure that we're clear on vocabulary. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the words that are up on the board right now. So we have some, so we'll look at the words in the black on the left first. Some, difference, prime, and composite. Do you guys have any idea what any of those mean? I know some means even. Some means even? Good. I know the difference is the answer and the subtraction problem. Okay. Um, composite is like a number that <laughs> You're on the right track. It's a number. It's a number that you, that is, you make like a table and uh, then composite is one number that is different than the other. Okay. So we'll take a look at those also. Um, prime and composite. Prime is a number that is not easily able to be multiplied to get to that number. And composite is a number that is easy to multiply numbers by to get to that answer. Okay, so let's take a look. If we want the sum of two numbers, am I gonna add, subtract, multiply, or divide them? Add. I'm gonna add them, all right? So if we want the sum, we're going to add two numbers. Everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. All right. If we want to find the difference between two numbers, I think one of you said it before, what will we need to do? Subtract. We'll need to subtract. A prime number, you said, was one that's not easily multiplied to get to it? Yeah. Okay. Can you give me an example of a prime number? Three. Three. Three is a perfect prime number because what factors or what can you multiply to get to three? You'd have to do like 2 times 1 plus 1. You could, but if we just want to multiply instead of adding anything. 3 times 1. It's just 3 times 1. That's it. There's no other way to get there, right? Okay. Can you think of another composite no or a prime number? 2. 2. Okay. 2 is a prime number, right? Because it's only 2 times 1 and that's it. 7. 7. All right. What about some composite numbers now? What's the difference there? 16. 16, right? Now, how do we know that's composite and not prime? Because it has more than one times itself. Right, so it has other factors, right? Yeah. Numbers that go into it, right? Because we can go one times 16, and what else can we do? 
Two times eight. Two times eight. Anything else? Um, four times four. Four times four. Anything else? And one times 16. Uh, we've got one times 16, right? So we have all the factors up there, right? Yeah. Okay. So we have this vocabulary, and we're all good with what they mean, right? Okay. Turn your paper over. And it says, Happy New Year. Is it really New Year right now? No. no. Yeah, it's, the, it's the new school year, right? But we'll go ahead and go with this. It says, what is the next year when? Now, the first one says the sum of the digits is 11. Now, based on the vocabulary we just did, do we know what sum means? Yes, it's yes. an answer to an addition problem. Right. So we want to know the next year, because what year is this? 2019. Okay, so up at the top, right, 2019. So we remember where we're at. We're going to go backwards in time. So let's take a look at this first one. When the sum of the digits is equal to 11. Now, if we took 2019 and we added up those numbers, what would we get? 39. Well, 2, 0, 1, and 9. Because you're adding 20 and 19. So just take 2, 0, 1, and 9. What do you get? 12. 12. 12. So the sum equals 12, doesn't it? Yeah. But what do we want the sum to equal? 11. 11. So let's take a look at the next year, 2020. If we go 2020, zero, zero, what does that add up to? Four. 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 That's not going to work. 2021? Uh, five. Five. 2022? Six. You get the idea? Yeah. yeah. So you can work together or individually. When is the next year when the numbers are going to equal 11? Think about the next year that all of the numbers are going to add up to 11. 2027? 2027? Let's see if anybody can get one sooner, because we want to know the next year, because 2027, right, write down the year 2027. Yeah. You think that's it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's take a look. Add those four numbers up. What do you get? 11. We get 11. Is there a year before 2027 where the sum of the digits will equal 11? No. no. So we've got the first one. And we'll work with some more math vocabulary with the students from Rio Bravo right after this. A big thanks to the staff and students at Rio Bravo Greeley School right there. Had a lot of fun knowing the vocabulary because math has its own language. Definitely. And understanding what they're looking for every time you're doing a math problem. Well, we do have another opportunity. We're going to go out live to Old River Elementary, visit with Mr. McCombs and Devin, and see what's going on. Hey, thanks a lot. Back here at Old River Elementary, talking with Mr. Clay. Clay McCombs is here with us. We just talked a little bit about touch math and the work he does with his uh, students in the, the uh, Moderate to Severe Autism Program, 4th to 6th grade. And we're going to nerd out right now. So this is your warning, ladies and gentlemen. We want you to join us for this conversation because we're going to do a deep dive into ways to explore the Fibonacci sequence. <laughs> I, dun, dun, dun. I hear all the explosions <laughs> going off at the, 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 the studio, all those effects going. So let's talk a little bit about who the heck Fibonacci is, why does he have a sequence, and what that sequence is all about. So Fibonacci, he was a European mathematician born 1175 and passed in 1250. We think, records were tough back then. We'll say 1250. Okay. His real name, Leonardo of Pisa. Pisa, Italy, where we have the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And you wanna take that one for us? He was the author of Liber Abaci, or the Book of the Abacus. Um, now, you know, we see an abacus as kind of a child's toy, but this was the big tool that they used to make sense of calculations during this time. It was the computer. It was how to use it. And he literally wrote the book. Okay. okay, so what is the Fibonacci sequence and why is it significant? So generalized sequence of first two positive integers and the next number is the sum of the previous two. We can do a little example here for you. Let's take a look here. So we start off with just our very basic one. Right? Okay, so we have one. We can add the number that came before, which really is nothing. Like, uh, if you really wanted to start, like, we can add the previous number to one, which is, I guess, zero here. So zero plus one would equal one. Sorry. 
Everybody always yeah. forgets about zero, zero in the one. sequence. They never throw it out there, but there it is. Now okay. we have one and one. If we okay. add those two numbers together, it's going to equal. We're going to get the two. two. Now we would then add the last two digits together and come up with the next sum. Equals three. This is going to go on literally forever. We've only got a few minutes here on the show, but we want to at least introduce you to those first early numbers as part of this sequence. So you have two plus three equals five, and three plus five equals eight, five plus eight equals 13, and this goes on forever. We'll keep adding because as you add positive numbers together, you get larger numbers, and there's no limit to how large these numbers can get. So I wanted to see if we could tie this together um, with the touch map that we had here because this is something that your students get to explore using the figures we were discussing in our previous segments. Mm -hmm. So we have, again, we, ha we know we have 1 plus 1 equals 2, so you would have two touch points, and then 2, 1 plus 2 would equal 3, and so on. So as they explore more of these sequences, because they're familiar with using touch math to get to the idea of counting on, it's going to allow them to process those next values much more easily. There we go. Had to get a clean paper. Okay, so, so 2 plus 3 equals 5. So if we were to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that gives us the sum of 5. And this could go on forever. So you have 3 plus 5. Sorry, there we go. 3. And you know, that's actually great. If we couldn't see it, we know that that's a 3, so we just count on from 3. So 4, so 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So there's our 8. Awesome. Now when we get into 5 plus 8, that's when we start getting into some of those double touch points. Yeah, so we have 8. We know 8's the larger number. Okay, so we can say the larger number, 8, and then we can count on. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and that's how we would come up with 13. So then when we do 8 plus 13, we'd start with 13 and then do our double touches, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Mm -hmm. So it's really powerful to see how this tool that your students use to make sense of um, addition allows them to jump into a very complex structure such as the Fibonacci sequence. And it's beautiful because we see the Fibonacci sequence everywhere. It is. It's everywhere. It's in sunflowers. It's in pineapples. It's in the Milky Way galaxy. It's in a nautilus shell. It's in the center of a sunflower actually unravels in a Fibonacci sequence pattern. It's really quite amazing. It's in um, the far reaches of space with Milky Way galaxy. And it's even found in something as silly as a toilet being flushed and the water circling down into a Fibonacci pattern. So the next time you're in there for 15 minutes and you have to explain yourself, you say, guys, Fibonacci. That's all I need to say. <laughs> now, what's great, too, is that um, this sequence and the patterns that it appears in um, become very evident as your students start to explore this through the work of art that they produce later on in the year. And when we come back, we're going to share some of those pieces with you at home. But for now, we're going to send it right back to the studio. Mike? All right, thanks for that, Clay and Devin. And in studio with us right now, we have Stanley, a fifth grade student from Stockdale, working on decimals in class and multiplying. You got a little taste of fractions before, so we're going to kind of go to the next step with everything, all right? So over to the board, young man. So in order for you to multiply decimals, here's a problem I want you to do. I would like you to select a number between 1 and 200. Ooh, 55. All right. Okay, so 55. You're going to buy 55 shares of, let's say, Chevron, one of our major sponsors, all right? Okay. You're going to buy 55 shares of Chevron. Every one of those costs, let's say, $48.13. So if I want to buy one share of Chevron, it's going to cost me $48.13. But I only don't want one, I want 55 of them. So how 
are you going to figure out what's that going to cost? So what kind of problem do we have? I didn't put a number here for you, or a, a sign here for you. Multiply, divide, add, subtract. What are we going to do with this? Uh, we're going to... Now that would make a smaller number, but we're going to get a really big number because we're going to have 4813 plus 4813 plus 4813 plus 40, 55 times. But instead of doing that, yeah, instead of doing the addition, we want to do some multiplication. So walk us through this. Tell us what you're going to do on this problem. So first I'm going to multiply 5 times 3, okay. which equals 15. Oh, I see. Okay, so you put the 5 down and carry the 1. Good. Next. And then I'll do 5 times 1, mm -hmm. put but you have to add one more, so it's six. Good. Put your decimal. And then Let's wait for the decimal to the very end, okay? I like that. We're going to wait till the very, very end of the problem. And then eight times nothing would equal. Remember, we're still doing five, right? Five oh, yeah, times eight, five, right there. Five times eight. Mm -hmm. What, would what be is that? Forty. Good. Four up here, zero down here. So you put the ones place down and carry the four. Good. Five times. Or five times four is twenty, mm -hmm. but you have to add the four, so it's twenty-four. Good. So far, you're doing a great job. And then really like to have that decimal there, huh? <laughs> Do forty. All right, we'll leave it there for now. Sixty-five. <laughs> now we're not done, because you use this five right here, right? We're done with that guy, but what about that one? No. Oh, it's I like that. You kind of cross it off so you know what's going on. No, it's five times. Three again, mm -hmm. which that one is 15. Good. So, five down here. And we're going to try again. Tell me a little bit about what happens when you do some multiplication and you're working on a, a number in the tens place. Where does that go? You almost started to do it, I saw uh, you. That would go right here. That's right. So, Because we're working on really not, we're multiplying times five, we're really multiplying times 50, right? Yeah. Okay, and then you, what do you want to put here in this spot? Zero. A zero? You can do that, sure. A little space holder there. And okay, good. So you said five times three is 15. You put down the five. You carry the one. Five times one. Five times one is one, but you have to oh, add... Try again. Five times one is... Five times one is six, but you have to add the one, so it's seven. Hold on. Try again. One more time. Ready? Five times one. Five times one is five. Five. There you go. And then you add one, uh -huh. which is... Six. Which is six. There you go. You're one step ahead of yourself. All yeah, right. He knew what he was going to do. Yeah, but as he was saying, and he was thinking <laughs> the other thing already. I knew what you're thinking. That's good. Next, five times eight. Five times eight is forty. Uh huh. I'll put the four up here. Put the zero down here. Good. Then five times four is twenty. Mm -hmm. Add the four. It's twenty-four. Good. You want to make sure that two lines up with that four, two, huh? Now take a look at this. Ready? On the top line we have five, six, zero, four, two. On the bottom line we have five, six, zero, four, two. Same answer. And that's because the first time you multiply times five and the second time you multiply times five, I will leave it up to you and our viewers to figure out. Maybe there's a shortcut next time you multiply times a double digit number. Mm-hmm. What's the last step? Add all of these numbers. Okay, so great. Five times zero is five. Good. Six plus five is 11, so mm -hmm. you put the one up there, one, the one down here, six times, or six plus zero is six, add the one, so it's seven. Good. It's four times zero, you can't do anything, so it's four. Good. And then there's nothing up there, so that would be a four. Try again, we're gonna do two plus four right here. Oh. Okay, so that's why I was saying it's really important to keep them in, the, in their own so spaces. Two, huh? Four plus two is six. Good. And then there's no other numbers to do it, so it's two. Two, gotcha. Aha, uh -huh. now you put the decimal in there. Tell me about a problem like this. When you're multiplying a decimal, how do you know where the decimal goes in at the very end of the problem? You would, or uh, like you would want, or, or add these. So, like the numbers that you've got to add over here, they, um, be the numbers out or... Uh, How about this way? Think about this. Answer me this question. How many decimal places are in the problem? How two. many numbers are to the right of the decimal? Two. There's two of them, right? One, two. Any decimal places in this one? Um, no, no. Just that one. So we have two places, right? So what we want is we want two decimal places in our answer. Can you make that happen? That's it. That's where the decimal goes, right? So you're going to go backwards two places here. You go backwards two places here. Tell me what I need to put before there. A money sign. 
Not a minus sign. What is this? What are we talking about here? Money. Money. Oh, a money sign. Yeah, not a minus sign. A money sign. What is this number, Stanley? Two, or two, sixty-four, and fifteen thousand or tenths. How about if I do this? Count. Can we talk about this? How much money is this? Two thousand six hundred forty-seven. Uh huh. And? And fifth and fifteen. I really like the way that you said that the first time and the second time. It really let us know how important it is to have the decimal in the right place and the comma because it's hard to read without a comma, right? You put that comma in there, you knew right what it was. That was good. So now we have the comma in the right place, decimal in the right place. Uh, Mike, apparently it's going to cost us $2,647.15 to buy 55 shares of Chevron. We'll see if they can donate it. That would be quite the deal, system. I think, right there. <laughs> and it's good that Stanley said it. Well, I think you said 1500s at the, the first time. Right. Right. And that's fine, which is why it's very important that you make sure you put a dollar sign on it so that we know that it is money right. and that there cannot be more than two numbers after the decimal point. Because let's say it came out. So here's what I'd like you to do. Sure. We're going to have one minute. Okay. I would like you to turn a percent into a decimal. Okay. I want you to turn 2% okay. into a decimal. And I will give you 50 seconds now. 2% into a decimal. How do we do it? Um, Have you ever done this before? Here's a great way to do it. Ready? This word is percent. What do you see in there that you recognize? It's a cent. How do you write two cents? Show me what it looks like on the cash register. Two cents. You wrote 20 cents, right? Or you, I see you did a cent sign, right? But we want to have a decimal here instead. So on the cash register, there's no cent sign. So how do you write two cents on the cash register if you're going to buy two things? We have a decimal here. Now what you did is you wrote 20 cents. We want to write two cents. So one last try. It's a tough one. How do you write two cents? Two hundredths. How about that? Two hundredths. Two's okay. Two's just fine. You did great. Uh, we ain't making room. There you there. go. Good. That's it. Just like that. Yep. And so 2% looks like 0 0.02, like 200. There you go. So I just wanted a little bit because you're going to do all three of these things during the entire fifth grade year. And for getting a little bit of taste of that, we're going to send you home with two tickets courtesy of CSUV to any sporting event that you like to go to. And we do have one more opportunity, our final opportunity to head out to Old River Elementary and uh, see who the special guest is with Devin today. And so like I say, like you have, you can't just do soda here, water. This is a professional, are, uh, are we live? Oh, hi everybody. Uh, we're back here at Old River Elementary. Oh, I'm so nervous. That's so embarrassing. We're here with Mr. Clay. Um, I'm Digit and Mr. Rossiter, Devin has, has let me kind of, let me break the fourth wall here to talk a little bit more about the Fibonacci sequence and the work that Mr. Clay does with it and his students with art. So. Let's talk about these numbers. Okay, so we're going to talk about Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio. So we've been talking about touch math and patterns in math. So here we have 1 plus 1 again equals 2, 2, 1 plus 2 equals 3, and so on. So this becomes what's called the golden ratio or phi. Now what's fascinating too, we talked about finding the Fibonacci sequence in unexpected places. We talked a little bit about this before the show how um, you actually see the Fibonacci sequence within the Fibonacci sequence. Like if you go back and you look at the difference between these two values, one and two, the difference between one and two is one. The difference between two and three is one. The difference between three and five is two. So the difference between each of these sets ends up being the Fibonacci sequence itself. It's everywhere. And so here's a, this is a geometric or ge um, pattern that shows you a geometric representation of the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio. So we have a square that is one unit long and one unit wide. It spirals into a square that is two wide to then the next one that fills a rectangle ends up with one being three wide. So we see the sum here. It leads to the sum here and leads to this other series of squares that ends up creating this beautiful proportional spiral. Now we mentioned that proportion and that's really important because we see that ratio everywhere in the world. 
including ancient Greece. So they figured out thousands of years ago that there is a beauty to having this ratio. So you mentioned that there is uh, the golden ratio that appears as a proportion within ancient architecture such as this. Yeah, so we have these rectangular shapes that are pleasant to the eye, and when we look at like this um, building here in ancient Greek, I believe this is the Acropolis. Yeah, the yeah. Acropolis in Greek architecture. So you have the shape that surrounds the perimeter of those front columns. That okay. is the length and the width of that rectangle is at that same golden ratio. Yeah. As well as you mentioned, the width of these rectangles here in the middle between the pillars. Yeah, so it's found there. And then the really awesome thing is it's also found, like we said, in a lot of art. So we have famous artists like da Vinci. He studied the, uh, the body and proportions and the golden ratio. And so you can find these proportions like in his famous Mona Lisa painting. So we mentioned that there's different distances that relate the golden ratio. You mentioned from the eyes to the hands mm -hmm. as one. So, yeah, so you have from the bottom of the painting to the top of her head. So the head makes up the, the smaller portion of the, the 1.6. And then you have from her chin to the bottom of her hands within the picture frame, that makes up the remaining portion of that 1.6 or the phi. Now you mentioned that your students get to work a lot with this in some of the art that they create. Yeah, so we, we've done, um, over the last three or four years, we've had an autism art show. It's Art Awareness Month in April every year. And so last year, we were able to create this golden ratio in some of the students' art. We created a pendulum that we hung in the center of the room. We filled it up with different colors, and we had the pendulum swing around and drip the paint onto the canvases, and so we got to see this play out in real time. So that spiral was very similar to what we saw as the spiral in the beginning with the squares laid out, mm -hmm. and that was happening just through a representation of physics happening right before your eyes. And so I believe we have an example of that um, up from the website, and I believe that's from the Old Rivers website where you show previous year's artworks. Yeah. So. On our website, if you go to Old River Elementary, you can locate the teacher page. And I have here from 2019, this is in real time here. So this is a example that we did with the pendulum art. So you can see those lines created by the pendulum as it drips down onto the squares that they created. That spiral ends up being a representation of the uh, Fibonacci sequence in action. Wonderful things going on in this space, uh, Mr. Clay. Thank you so much for having us. and. Uh, for any of the guests that allow us to come into their space, we want to thank you for your support for the program and for what you do with kids by honoring you with our honorary cool. Do the Math tile. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Mr. Clay, thank you so much. Okay. Clay McCombs here at Old River Elementary. For now, we're going to wrap it up and send it back to the studio. Mike, take it away. All right. Thanks for that, Clay. Thanks for that, Devin, and a lot of different things going on over there at Old River Elementary. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30 this afternoon, as we do most Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Stanley, did you have a good time today? Mm -hmm. So you've done fractions, decimals, percents, multiplying, dividing, all sorts of things today. You are now an ambassador for Do the Math. <laughs> you ready for those duties? All right, they're rather extensive, so we'll go over those after the show. But until we meet again, continue to do the math. Support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Bakersfield West Rotary Stroop Family Foundation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and the Kern High School District with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.